What do you think of people who burn the American flag or spray graffiti on the Lincoln Memorial or spit and boycott veterans' funerals? Even though our country is living a tempest in a teapot socially and there's a lot of upheaval, chances are, at least in this assembly, there is a majority of us that would say that is a sacrilege. That is desecration. That is unpatriotic, un-American. And we would challenge anyone, what kind of a citizen are you to do that in this country? Well, if that is your emotion and that is your sentiment, and I'm not arguing if it's right or wrong, then you know precisely what it was like to live in the first century world and be a religious Jew on issues of the Sabbath. Because being a religious Jew, if you violated the Sabbath in any way, it was considered high sacrilege against God and woefully unpatriotic to be an Israelite. And those of Jesus' day, those religious men and women of piety, understood that this was not anything peripheral. It was one of the Big Ten. It was the Fourth Commandment. And God actually has been known to kill people for desecrating the Sabbath. The first century religious establishment of Jesus' day understood, they were good historians, they understood that they came from the land of bondage to the promised land, in part because of these covenantal requirements listed in Exodus 20, but they also understood in their history that they go go, go from the promised land back to the land of bondage and spend 70 years in captivity for desecrating the Sabbath. That was one of the reasons listed for having their home stripped from them. The irony of Jesus' day in the religious establishment is that they were living under pagan rule right at the time. They were under a police state by the Romans. If there's anybody more pagan than the Romans, I don't know it. And so more and more with each passing day, The Jews of Jesus' day had it rubbed in their noses of pagan culture, pagan economy, pagan gods, pagan worship of Rome. And many, particularly a little sect known as the Pharisees, given to them by their opponents because they were the purists, they believed that the only way out of pagan entrapments was to go back to the Mosaic law. And they believed that God would honor his people and Israel would come out from underneath the Romans, the Messiah, the Messianic age would be established, and they would come back to national prominence. So this was their chance to weed out the pretenders from the purists. And so in the first century, there's at least a dozen cases in the Gospels where Jesus is challenged over Sabbath issues. And you've heard the, uh, you've, you've heard the moniker, or the, rather the motto, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's precisely what the Pharisees did. They went from one extreme to the other. And sometimes that happens in life. It can happen to us. We can overreach, particularly when it comes to laws. There can be one law that is meant for good in its intention, i.e. the Sabbath, and mankind can throw so many rules that we actually discrepant the law. And that's exactly what happened to the passionate religious establishment trying to make sure that Israel desperately did an about-face, honored the fourth commandment, and in doing so created so many rules that no one could adhere to them. Let me mention a few. These all come, by the way, from a historical book written based upon Jesus' day 
but it was completed in the second century and a few centuries thereafter, two books actually. One was known as the Mishnah and one was known as the Talmud. By the way, your Orthodox Jewish friends still subscribe to these. And they're history books written on Jewish religious life. The Talmud, for example, has 29 chapters devoted to adherence to the Sabbath. And of those 29 chapters, they're rules, by the way, there are 37 categories of work that you should or should not perform on the Sabbath. Let me mention a few to let you know what the people of Jesus' day were living in. Did you know that in Jesus' day, it was a violation of the Sabbath? It was considered work, which was the persona non grata of the Sabbath. If you worked on it, you violated the Sabbath. At least that was the perception of the religious establishment. That you could not travel 1,000 yards on the Sabbath or exceed that. If you did, that was considered work, 10 football fields. This, by the way, is why if you have Orthodox Jewish friends today and they subscribe to the Talmud, they will live around their synagogue. They will live close to their synagogue because they don't want to, they can't travel very far. Um, we would have violated the Sabbath just by driving in today. We would have violated it six different ways. Now, as so often is the case with overburden of rules, there's an exception of the rule. And there was an exception of this rule. If you were walking a thousand yards on the Sabbath and you came to the limit, you could take a piece of yarn that measured out another thousand yards, tie it to yourself, tie it to the post or tree that exceeded the 1,000 yards and travel an additional 1,000 yards because the Talmud said that you're using the 1,000 yards of God's people in that city and you're only traveling your own 1,000 yards. But you have to have a, yarn, a, yarn, a piece of string attached to you to do that. But you can't travel one more yard or that would be a violation of the Sabbath. Now that's just one of the hundreds of rules that you had to remember for Sabbath keeping. Did you know that it was a violation of the Sabbath to carry a load? Well, what is a load, you ask? A load, according to the Mishnah, was anything that weighed heavier than a dried up fig. You could actually carry something twice that weighed less than a drive up fig, but anything more was considered work. So for example, there's actually cases out there in Jesus' day. If you were on the Sabbath, you would want to make sure that you were wearing the clothes on your back from the day before. That didn't count as a load. But on the Sabbath, if you changed your clothes and put new clothes on, that is heavier than a load and you have just violated the Sabbath. There are eating restrictions on the Sabbath. You could not eat anything more than or larger than an olive. If you bit into the olive, there's a rule for this, and you found out the olive was rotten, that counted. But you had to dice up everything and eat anything smaller than an olive on the Sabbath. If you were eating a big feast the night before and then Sabbath hit, you had to stop, get up from the table, and go about your business. You couldn't carry more than two letters. Two letters was considered a load. You could not weave or stitch, dye, or, or mend any clothing on the Sabbath. People did not take baths on the Sabbath for fear that water would overflow, spill out on the floor, thus washing the floor, which constituted as work. Yes, there is such a rule. Women did not look at the mirror on the Sabbath for fear they would pluck out a gray hair, which is considered work. You could kill a louse, but not a flea, because according to the Talmud, a flea was a predator that worked, and you would be doing work by killing the worker on the Sabbath. On and on this thing sort of went. You could not drag a chair on the dirt floor because to do so created a trench. And thus you worked on the Sabbath. You could not do business with any Gentile on the Sabbath. Here are some of the prohibitions of the Sabbath. Are you ready? Sewing, plowing, reaping, grinding, baking, threshing, binding sheaves, winnowing, sifting, dyeing, shearing, spinning, kneading, separating, weaving, tying, untying, and sewing to stitches. What if a man spits? There's actually a rule for this. 
If a man spits on the Sabbath outdoors and his spittle hits a rock, by the way, who's watching this? But anyway, if your spittle hits a rock and it dissipates, you're okay. But if a guy spits and it hits the dirt, creates a furrow, you have just worked and you're in violation of the Sabbath. You can do your own reading on this. It's free on Google. <laughs> just keyword Talmud for light, nice light reading. If you're ever having trouble sleeping, you can read that. Let me mention two of my favorite cases of all time that I've come across. Both of these occurred in the first century. Both occurred in Jesus' day. This is what overbearance of rules does. There was a case actually argued before a synagogue court over a possible violation of the Sabbath that, if declared guilty, would incur vast punishment. It involved, are you ready, an egg. The question was, what do you do about a hen that lays an egg on the Sabbath? Now, this is a technical question. It deals with work. The hen was, could not be found for interrogation, so it was determined, okay, if the hen laid an egg on the Sabbath, you could not use that egg because work had been performed by the hen. But if you could prove that the egg was hatched the night before, or the day before the Sabbath, and the hen was only keeping it warm, then, this is literally what it says, you can count this as a gift from the Almighty. Isn't this what rules do? Should we or should we not have an omelet this morning? I don't know. Did it work or not? This is what it, the, the life that Jesus lived, the world that he lived in. The second case <laughs> involved an elderly woman, a Jewish woman, who, I don't know the details, but she fell in a field. I don't know if she broke her hip, but she was rendered incapacitated while walking to her house on the Sabbath. She fell, fell in a ditch in the field, and she needed help. Could she shout for help? Could she crawl and get up help? It, came to be that four men came to rescue her. Could they then go back to her house, get a litter, and bring her out of the field? Because if she weighed the litter down, the two handles would create a trench in the road, thus creating a violation of the Sabbath. So, this was a quite a conundrum. Should we leave Granny out in the field and come go get her the day after Sabbath, hoping she does okay, or do we go get her and, and, and tempt ourselves that we've actually worked on the Sabbath? Now, this is the kind of nonsense Jesus does not abide. And that's why he comes crashing into their life and upending it. It is no wonder, by the way, that it is to this group on this issue that Jesus says, without horns or without teeth, the Sabbath was made for man, not the opposite. And you've made the opposite out of it. And by the way, this is the same group, and don't miss this, it's quite provocative, where Jesus says that they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders. So, now that we've read Exodus 20 and we see the fourth command, hopefully you were here last week, you understand the background, God the Creator, God the Redeemer, what the Sabbath is, what it isn't. Now let's see what Jesus thinks of this command. And he changes everything. I would like to take you to one of the dozen events. So if you would, turn to Matthew 12. Because we're right in the middle of this controversy of all the rules. And by the way, what's so sad, and this, this can happen today with an excess of rules and what I call an overreach. If you're not careful, the rules themselves becomes the gauge of spirituality. And, 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 and that's dangerous. And Jesus comes blowing that out of the water. So in Matthew 12, here we have a situation. We'll begin in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on a Sabbath. 
His disciples were hungry, and they began to pick heads of wheat and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is against the law to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry, how he entered the house of God and ate the sacred bread, which was against the law for him and his companions to eat, but only for the priests? Or, have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet they were not guilty? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The incident that triggered this entire discussion was a simple one. The disciples and Jesus are walking in a field on a Sabbath. The disciples get hungry and they do what we all do. They eat. And that is their crime. Can you believe those evil, wicked, imposter disciples to actually have the temerity to eat when they're hungry on the Sabbath? But that's exactly what the Pharisees are trying to do. By the way, um, they're in the middle of a wheat field, a grain field, and out pop the Pharisees. It's sort of like hee-haw. Remember the people that parted the corn? I mean, this is, this is clearly a sting operation. We know that because they accuse. Why do your disciples uh, are, are, are guilty of breaking the Sabbath? Well, they're not, dum-dum. But that's what you think. Why? Because they've put all these rules on, on this issue. And so now they're beginning to think, you break our rule, therefore you're sinning against God. Now I want you to see what Jesus says to them. It's quite brilliant. If you just look at the blueprint of the whole section, what does he do? How does he answer them? You got it. You got it. Verse 3. Haven't you read the Bible? Verse 5. Haven't you read the Bible? Verse 7. If you actually read the Bible, you would have read this. And then he quotes from the prophet. So Jesus is exposing that they actually love the rules that they've created about the Sabbath more than they do what the Bible said about the Sabbath. Had they actually read the Bible, Jesus is saying, you would have read the story of Joshua and the children of Israel walking around Jericho seven times. I know that that's a pretty significant story for Israel's history. Remember that story, Israel? Had you read your Bible, you would have read that story. That seven times, I hate to tell you, they exceeded 1,000 yards walking around Jericho. God commanded them to do it. And by the way, this all happened on the Sabbath. And they were never condemned for it. Had you read your Bible, you would have read that story in Deuteronomy chapter 23, which says quite clearly, when you've entered your neighbor's grain field, you may pluck the heads and eat it with your hand. Which is exactly what my disciples are doing. Had you read your Bible, you would have read the story of 1 Samuel 21, where David and his men on the run from wicked King Saul go up to the tabernacle on the Sabbath. They're starving. They haven't had food in days. And they come to the priest who had prepared 12 loaves of bread in accordance to the corporate worship, set those 12 loaves of bread in the most holy place, and only they could eat them. And the priests and David, neither one desecrated the Sabbath when the priest took the 12 loaves and gave it to hungry men and they ate it on the Sabbath. Had you read your Bible, you would have known they didn't violate the Sabbath then. Well, what's the difference between what David is doing and what my disciples are doing? Oh, and by the way, uh, Pharisees, you don't hesitate to release an ox or a donkey to go get a drink of water on the Sabbath. Well, why do you accuse me of breaking the Sabbath when I release a daughter of Abraham from demonic possession? That's Luke 13. So they would rather this girl continue to be demon-possessed and wait the next day than to be made whole, but they have no problem releasing their donkey or ox to go get water on the Sabbath. That's Luke 13. 
They have no hesitancies to rescue a sheep or an ox from a ditch on the Sabbath. But as Jesus says here in Matthew 12 and in Luke 12, isn't mankind more valuable than an animal? Or one of my particular favorites to, to expose their hypocrisy, John 7. Um, don't you guys circumcise male children on the Sabbath? Isn't that work? Well, why are you castigating me when I make someone whole on the Sabbath by delivering them from disease? So on and on he goes. But two things stand out in Matthew 12 as we pivot to the New Testament world. They are both about what Jesus says about himself in a context of Sabbath. The first, mentioned in verse 6, something greater than the temple is here. Now that's fighting words. Because if you're living in the first century world and you're a Jew in Israel under Roman occupation, the temple means everything to you. It's not just the center of your religious life. It is your life. 20 acres of temple treasury where offerings are made, sacrifices are done, songs are sung, and most importantly, God himself comes down and dwells in the temple. And Jesus Christ has the temerity to say something better than the temple is now here. I'm superior than a man-made structure. And you want to see where the fullness of God dwells that's not man-made, look at them, believe on them, because I, the Godhead, dwells in me bodily, and I wasn't created, I wasn't made. That temple, that structure, that building is inferior, it's secondary, it's insignificant in comparison to what I am. And just to screw in this a little bit more, verse 8 he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am the sole interpreter. I'm the trump card that takes the deck on everything related to the Sabbath. The Sabbath goes through me. I created it. I interpreted it. And now I fulfill it. And I am the Sabbath. Now, let's put all that context, all that controversy, all that Sabbath issue of what is Jesus saying here? Because it's a whole new world now for Jesus. No one in history says this but Jesus. There is a precious verse probably to most of us in this room right before this Sabbath controversy. It's in Matthew 11. Do not divorce it from the Sabbath controversy. It should not be divorced. We generalize it. I do the same. I generalize it. But Jesus is addressing those who are the recipients of all of these rules, the rest of Israel. And he says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. Now we generalize it and say, oh, come to Jesus if you're having a bad day, if you're oppressed. Try I get it. I don't have a problem with that. I do it all the time. Jesus is for that too. But in the specific context, what is, this is a Sabbath context. What is happening to Israel because of the rule makers of the Pharisees? They are being burdened down with rules. They are being oppressed with all of these Sabbath rules, so they don't think they'll ever be close to God because they walk 1,000 in one yard and break the Sabbath. Or they pluck wheat and get accosted by people saying that, you know, they violated the Sabbath. It's just burdensome restrictions. And Jesus is saying, you, any one of you who are burdened down with these self-righteous rules, you come to me and you will have what? Sabbath. Rest. The very thing these boys can't do for you. The very thing they're desperately trying to get. That only I can give you rest. Believe in me. I am your Sabbath rest. And when you come to me, all these restrictions go down the tubes. Because I'm the fulfillment 
I am the Lord. I am greater than any religious system there is. Come to me, and you'll have Sabbath rest. Now, brothers and sisters, as we turn the corner, <clears throat> this is, and I cannot emphasize this enough, how the New Testament world understood Sabbath issues is that Jesus is our Sabbath. Jesus is now our rest. And they did this in many, many different ways. They understood that something happened that was so dramatic it created a whole new world and it was called the resurrection of Jesus. And the Christians of the first century world understood that the resurrection changed everything, that they actually changed their day of worship. And you will never, and you're fine to go search it and even take me to task because I might learn something from you, but I didn't find it. You will never find a New Testament passage that explicitly teaches a Old Testament Sabbath for Christians to adhere to. Rather, you see something quite different. Now Christians, by deliberate design, gather, according to John 20, according to Acts, on the first day of the week or as John in Revelation called it, the Lord's Day. No longer do they call it Sabbath, because that's the seventh day. Jews do that in adherence to Old Testament law that is fulfilled in Jesus, and he now becomes our rest, and Christians understood this. The resurrection changes everything, so they meet on the first day of the week. Why? Because the paper, rock, scissors? No, because that's when Jesus rose. And so every Lord's Day, once every seven days, the way we rest is it's Easter Sunday every week. We're always celebrating the resurrection because Jesus changes everything. This is precisely how the New Testament writers speak. So, for example, we won't do this for sake of time, but you can read it on your own. The entire chapter of Hebrews 4, an author that knows a whole lot about the Old Testament and uses a half a dozen passages about the Sabbath in Hebrews 4 to say, we now, because of Jesus, are looking for heavenly Sabbath and our home of eternal rest only because Jesus is our rest. You'll find that at the end of Hebrews 4. I would like us to see one passage because here's where we begin to talk about, okay, Brian, how should we celebrate Sunday? Do we do it at all like the Sabbath? Should we work? Should we play? What should we do? And here's where we will unleash our consciences. I told you last week about my parents. Um, I remember growing up, my dad, they, both my parents, blue collar people. So it was very important to them that their kids worked. So we had to get a job. And I, I mean, I think sixth grade it started. Lawn, you, can, you can mow the lawn, right? Go mow the lawn. Charge people for it, do a good job, don't steal, be honest, this sort of thing. So I worked, but I was always taught by my dad, you do not work on Sunday. But my father would have no problem because I saw this once, I saw it a dozen times, driving down the highway on a Sunday and seeing someone stranded on the road, he would stop and help him every time. And I'm like, well, Dad, isn't that work? <laughs> well, the ox is in the ditch. He would always say that to me. Well, the ox is in the ditch. But I understood acts of mercy, but I'm like, okay, all right, whatever. So, Paul the apostle, would write to three different congregations. The church of Galatia, the church of Colossae, and the Roman church. And in each letter to different congregations, the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, comes up a little bit. 
In Galatians, it was perhaps the most dangerous. We've been in Galatians, right? So what you have in all three contexts is a problem that we got to work through. Because you have Gentiles that have never practiced Sabbath a day in their life. Pagans don't do that. They have never had a holy day, a holiday in monotheism. They're pagan. They come to Christ and they enter the church. And they're worshiping alongside Jews who did celebrate a Sabbath every week, who did celebrate holy days and festivals. And they come to Christ and now they're in the same congregation as pagans who don't know what a Sabbath is, to Jews that that's very sacred to them. So how is this going to work? Well, the problem in Galatians, you know what, we spent a year there, two years there. The Jewish Christians said, you have to celebrate the Sabbath like us to be a Christian. And Paul said, oh, no, you don't. You'll go, you'll go back under works if you do that. So that's the Galatian problem. You can handle that yourself. I won't look at that. The Romans problem is more about preference. And that Jews and Gentiles worship together. But some say, you know, one day is no day better than the next. What's, I mean, this, this seventh day or this first day, how is that more, isn't God the same God of all? And others say, well, we should distinguish it because, and that's more preferential. What we have in Colossians is the same sort of thing, but deeply theological. That's what I want you to see here of how Christ is our rest. He is our Sabbath and he changes everything. So I'd like you to turn with me to Colossians. This will be chapter 2. And I'm going to set, uh, set this up and then for a few moments before we close, give you a little bit of how to navigate as a church today through issues of Sunday. And what I think we have good ground on and the rest of the stuff is, is up to you. And we should not make it an issue of fellowship over. So Colossians 2, if I can get there, beginning in verse 6. <clears throat> Therefore, just as you had received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and firm in your faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Be careful not to allow anyone to captivate you through empty, deceitful philosophy that is according to human tradition and the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Similar language to the temple. In the temple, God comes down and dwells among his people. But... We don't go to Jerusalem anymore and worship the temple. We don't celebrate the Passover anymore. We don't circumcise our male children religiously anymore. We do not adhere to an Old Testament Sabbath. What is the common reason? Christ dwells in bodily form in the deity. And you have been filled in him, and he's head over every ruler and authority. Verse 11, in Christ you also were circumcised, however, not done by human hands, but by the removal of a fleshly body, body that is through the circumcision done by Christ. Do you see the battering ram of Paul? It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's always been Christ. It's only Christ. It'll always be Christ. Why is it? Verse 12 and following. Having been buried with him in baptism, you have been raised with Christ through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. There, there it is, the resurrection. It changes everything. It's a whole new world. And even though you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he nevertheless made you alive with him. That's a term for resurrection. Having forgiven all your transgressions, he has destroyed what was against us, a certificate of indebtedness expressed in decrees opposed to us. He has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. 
disarming the rulers and authorities. He has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross and the resurrection changes everything. You dwell in Jesus. Now, that's the theological foundation. Paul switches to how we apply this. Verse 16, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? It speaks of because of this, because of what we just said about Christ's resurrection. Do not let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink or in the matter of a feast or in a new moon or Sabbath days. Do you get that? Because of the resurrection of Christ, you're under no obligation by anybody to celebrate Sabbath days like they did of old. And just so we understand one another, notice the next line. What were those for? Those were only a shadow of things to come, right? You walk out here in a minute, beautiful day, gorgeous day. Thank you, God, for this day finally. Maybe we'll get warm weather steady. And you see your shadow. Your shadow is not you. It's a shadow, an extension of the real thing. And Paul is saying these Sabbaths, holy days, festival days, all this was a shadow of things to come, but Jesus is the reality. Jesus is your Sabbath. Jesus is where you find rest because of his resurrection. As B.B. Warfield once said, Christ took the Sabbath into the grave with him and brought the Lord's day out of the grave with him on resurrection morning. Now, how do we practice this? This could, if we're not careful, be like walking through a, blind, a minefield blindfolded, but we have the scripture. So let me give you one thing that I know we should tenaciously hold to, and the rest, I think, is liberty of conscience, and I am happy to leave it there, and I know that not all of you will like me leaving it there, but that's okay. Richard Baxter, the Reformed pastor of Kidderminster, the king's chaplain in the 1600s of England, many of you know Richard Baxter. If you had a photo of him, he looks pitiful and pale and sickly, and you wonder, is that what spirituality looked like in the 1600s? They never smile. Richard Baxter has wrote four different books, one of which I read every two years. I actually require every elder-to-be candidate to read The Reformed Pastor. Those of you that read it know that next to Spurgeon and Baxter is one of him and Spurgeon are the two guys that have the spiritual gift of discouragement in my life. That is to say, I read their works and then I throw the work against the wall saying there is no way I can be this kind of pastor. Richard Baxter, now let me just say, very, very quirky, disturbing theology. But his concern for his souls at Kidderminster was nothing less of a miracle. By the time he died... 800 families were coming to his church from a town of 300 people. When he got there 20 years before, only six people were attending church. 800 families in a town of 300. Well, he writes a book besides the Reformed pastor called A Christian Directory. <laughs> it has three million words. Uh, and this is all done before they had electricity. You think, when did this guy write this? Here is what Richard Baxter tells his people. He pastors. Here's how he tells his church how to honor Sunday. <laughs> Buckle up. Uh, when you, on Sunday morning, you should rise at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, he says this on a Sunday morning service. You should rise at 5 o'clock in the morning and pray in private for an hour. Then, before breakfast, now I would already be in a bad mood, but anyway. Then before breakfast, you should have another hour of family devotions. 
Then go to church. And I love this is in his text, there's a parenthetical thought. Go to church, but do not sleep in church. That's what he says. <laughs> After returning home, while the noon meal, pity on the wise preparing this one, while the noon meal is being prepared, go in your closet and pray in private for an hour and review everything the preacher said in church. Then enjoy a festive meal with conversation about the love of our Redeemer or something fitting the pastor said on Sunday. After the meal, gather the family for an hour for psalm and hymn singing and further instruction. Go to church again, come home, and gather as a family, everyone for another hour to call upon God in prayer and song and then rehearse the sermon. After you eat dinner, but not too much, just like you did at noon after the evening meal, begin to question your children and your household servants about what they learned during the day. Then conclude for another hour of psalm singing with prayer and end the day with happy, holy thoughts. <laughs> that is a lot of work on the Sabbath. I do not suggest that that's what you do. It was good for kid a minister, I suppose. So it does not answer my question that I pose to you. How do we celebrate Sunday? <clears throat> there really is only one consistent theme throughout the New Testament and beyond of how the Christian church celebrating the resurrection celebrated Sunday properly. Believe it or not, it had little to do with work. It had little to do with travel and should we play sports or not play sports or should we watch sports. It had little to do with that, if anything. The one common theme is that on Sunday we gather together and worship Christ's resurrection. That is what separates one day from the next. It is true that there is no one day higher above the other because you're always thinking about the resurrection. But on Sunday, the closest to heaven, when every tongue and tribe and people are gathered around the throne to worship the resurrection, on the first day of the week, the day of his resurrection, the saints gather together to celebrate his resurrection. This is what I said last week. It is bizarre, and it's just foreign to the New Testament world for Christians not to gather with one another and assemble on, uh, over the resurrection. Our own confession of faith gives us great liberties, the Baptist faith and message. Here's what our own confession of faith, which is the rule of faith and practice for this church, states about the first day of the week. The first day of the week is called the Lord's Day. It is a Christ Christian institution for regular observance. It commemorates the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and should include exercises of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private. Activities on the Lord's Day should commensurate with the Christian's conscience under the Lordship of Jesus. That's what I leave you with. All the other things that you and I might dispute over, should we, should we not, is left, I think, up to Christian conscience. As long as we understand that the Lord's Day is a day where the saints gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So how do you view Sunday? Do you think of it as a day of worship or to try to get through duties as quickly as possible. I remember hearing from a lady um, who called me, this is a few years back, whose church was beginning a Saturday night service. Now, not against Saturday night services per se, but her response was troubling to me. She was glad they started a Saturday night service because in his, her words, she was happy she could go to Saturday night so that her worship could be done and her Sundays could be uninterrupted from the pesky task of worshiping with God with his people. So she saw God's worship as an interruption. 
in her words, a pesky task. So is Sunday for you a trial or a treat? Is it a delight or a duty? Do you view it more like Christmas morning or more like tax day? That is the difference. Father, I thank you for these sweet people, for their patience and their love of you. And Lord, as each of us navigate through our own convictions about this wonderful day, may we understand what unites us, and that is Jesus. And so as we take this meal, we're reminded of a heavenly rest that is awaiting us because of Jesus. As we take this meal, we're reminded that all the burdens and the weightiness of religious entrapments are gone because we rest in Jesus. And God, I remember that famous prayer by Augustine. You have formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you.